call the uh, public meeting of this December 7th meeting of the Board of Curators to order again. And uh, as all of the general officers and all of the members of the board know, this is a, a, a new portion of the meeting uh, early, early in this year of the two of the year uh, 2017, a decision was made to do a board self-assessment. Uh, then the decision was made to delay that until we had a full complement of board members. So uh, we're going to do the board self-assessment now. And at about 11.15, uh, we'll go into an executive session, which will be a continuation of the board assessment, but addressing matters that must be addressed in executive session. So at this time, I'll call upon Daryl Chapman, uh, chairman of the governance committee to introduce the facilitator for this portion of the program. Thank you, chairman. Um, the governance committee has one information item this morning, and that is the board assessment. I'd like to introduce Terry McTaggart um, from AGB. Um, who has assisted us um, in doing a lot of things in the last couple of months in helping us prepare for this morning. I want to say the purpose of this <coughs> board assessment is to help this board be, be great and to perform as best as we can for this great university system. So we're really excited about this opportunity to work with Terry. So Terry, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Daryl, and uh, thank all of you for this opportunity for two reasons. Uh, first, I uh, went to school in St. Louis, graduate school, a long time ago, and it is just wonderful to be back in Missouri. We you know, used to explore around the state when we weren't studying, who saw the Curtaway, the cities where your institutions are in, uh, but this is just on a personal level a treat. On a professional level, even more importantly, Daryl took the words out of my mouth. Uh, today in higher education for boards, for institutions, it's not about being adequate. It's not about just following best practices. Uh, it's not about honoring the legacy entirely. It's about moving as, uh, that, in that very familiar line from good to great, each in their own way. Um, and my job today is to uh, facilitate a conversation of yourselves, both veteran members and new members of the board, which is a fabulous strength that you have, uh, 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 to be sure. Um, in getting to the point where you can operate as a cohesive group and moving this institution forward in partnership with his, your president and his team. Quick definition of what great boards do, they work with their president to build extraordinary institutions. I mean, figure out how to do that, you're going to be way ahead of, ahead of the game. Let me kind of frame this thing up fairly quickly and then I'll pipe down and just uh, do everything I can to have this conversation flow. We've got too much to do in the three hours in front of us. That's okay. It's going to be a start on some, on some critical issues, and you'll have the opportunity to say, okay, uh, how do we want to follow up on some of these things as a board? So just, just so that's understood from the, from the get-go. Um, I have this primitive kind of... Um, AV, and it has never failed me. So that, that's why I'm uh, using it today. Thanks and congratulations. Congratulations part is the opportunity you have to lead positive change in this environment. The assessment part, and this is going to be mercifully brief, um, is that you've got about five qualities that I think put you in a sweet spot to really lead positive change with your colleagues in the faculty and particularly with your chief executive. And let me just lay that out quickly. So the, uh, the punchline on the assessment is that to be a high performing system, you've got many, many of the right qualities. You've got the right kinds of institutions. You heard the faculty talk this morning about the importance of research. And you also heard, I think it was John say, uh, people understand athletics, research, not so much. Nevertheless, the real powerhouses in this country are the research universities, and finding a way to communicate that, and frankly, to be even more productive than you are now, should be a major priority of this institution. So I have a hunch it is of the presidents who knows 
how important that is. Not because research is kind of a holy grail and a, and a kind of um, uh, a kind of special quality that no one can fully understand. No, but because it's important to the society, it's important to the economy, and frankly, it's important to your prestige and drawing power as an institution. You've got the right universities, um, the, um, the right board. Some people see a problem with the fact that you've got so many new members on the one hand and so many veteran members on the other. I don't. To me, this is the making of a fabulous team. You've got people that understand the taboos and the culture on the one hand and have been through some very, very difficult times. And you've got people with a fresh perspective, okay, who bring, in my mind, a very contemporary set of understandings about the university as an enterprise, not merely a legacy organization. What a huge plus, figuring out, and that's uh, work you've started already, frankly, um, but which we'll be focusing to agree on, on today, how to bring those two strengths together so that they really work for the University of Missouri system. I think you got the right board. You got the, um, you got the right leaders. You know, I've been in this business for about 40 years, and uh, all of you who've been in business or some other sports or some other enterprise know you can pick up fairly quickly who's sharp and capable and energetic and a real leader and who's, I don't know, a time server or in it for the, the paycheck. And I'm just going on relatively first impressions to be sure, you know, we've had our conversations, but I think you've got the right leaders here. I, I happened to do some work on the University of Connecticut and its marvelous turnaround some time ago from being the embarrassment in stores to being one of the national go-to places. So your president by experience and also I might say, if I may say, by personality is the right guy to be leading this thing. <laughs> right size. How would you like to be on the board of the, uh, of the uh, New York system? 64 institutions, each with their own political affiliations in their regions. How would you get anything done in that kind of environment? How would you like to be on the board of SIU? Two institutions. You've got the right number, and they're all, uh, some are more developed than others, but they're all in one fashion or another research universities. It's unlike the Minnesota system, which combines technical colleges, community colleges, and teaching institutions. How do you bring that together? You've got a much more focused, um, focused set of providers to work with. So I think you're the right size, and you're all over the state. There's no taxpayer citizen in Missouri who doesn't benefit if they only realized it and were told the story, doesn't benefit from the work you do and the work the faculty you talked to this morning do and the universities at large. There's no reason why you can't achieve what Daryl was talking about and being exceptional. Now, fortunately, there's no ranking by US News and World Report of systems because they're all so different. There are about 64 of them in the country and they're all different in terms of makeup and operating principles, leadership, culture, and that kind of thing. But uh, given the, uh, the realities of leading this system, there are no reasons why you guys can't be exceptional. And personally, I think what, that's what the focus needs to be on. Not 2015, as difficult as that was, you've learned from it. Let's focus on, on being just an absolutely exceptional board in the world we live in today. So, um, how to turn those, um, those upbeat words into something practical. Um, my suggestion today, and it's in your uh, agenda and the material that I sent out, and this came out of our conversations. You know, this wasn't a kind of prepackaged thing that, that, uh, that I would present at any one of these things. Initial conversation about what your core mission is as the board. What is the function of a board? Some of you, I think, want to roll up your sleeves and get in there and fix some of the problems that are just very apparent to you. Well, is that the right way to go? What do you have an administration for? If that's part of your reality. On the other, I think there may be some on the board who have a very uh, traditional and, and frankly very credible understanding of, of their role, and that is we hire the president, they do well, fine, they don't do so well, we say goodbye to them and get somebody who can't. I'm going to argue that both of those are extremes, and you need to find the, the uh, sweet spot in the center 
where the board is active and working with the president on how you're going to move this system forward, but recognizing the administration and the president is kind of a tool for you. And the two of you working together are going to be hard to, boot. There's hard to beat. There's a truism in, in, uh, in this business, a really strong board, and I think this is a, a strong board, and a weak president can only elect its officers. You would be doomed to frustration if you said, we're going to do it all ourselves. On the other hand, a really strong, capable administration and a passive board, frankly, in the short run, they can get some things done, but without the backing of the board when the going gets rough and opposition arises to tough calls, eh, that president usually can't get it done because the, the board gets carried away by a no confidence vote or pushback or whatever it might be. You put the two of them together, a strong, smart, experienced, capable board, and the same with the president, it's hard to beat. That's the spot you need to, need to be in going forward. And for my conversations, at least, and part of the culture of, of the people that I've talked to, uh, there's more than a willingness to, to do that. So what is your core mission? What the hell is your job after all? First topic. Second topic, working relationship with the board and the president, okay? Um, AGB's mantra that I happen to write, so you know, I, I, I don't endorse everything they say, but in this case, I, I have the advantage of thinking it was very astute, uh, is that the best, best boards work effectively with their president. And you kind of figure out where do we dominate, where does he dominate, where do we converse so we're on the same page. You get that formula down and you're, you'll be just about unstoppable. Okay. Uh, I borrowed a phrase for that, and I'll mention it briefly a little bit later, called governance for results. Uh, some of you may know a colleague and friend of mine named T Tom Meredith. He's been the head of a, a number of, of uh, systems in the country. And his, his uh, view is, once you agree on the results, you talk about the process. I mean, you're not going to say, just leave it up to him. You're going to want to be assured that it's a process that's going to lead to a product that you want. But then you let the president and his team take over and do what they do best working with their faculty, colleagues in whatever fashion. And you monitor it, you, you evaluate how it's working, are you getting the results you want, and you may make some changes. But that's the, the kind of uh, focus on governance for results. And then we'll have our conversation in executive session about, uh, about performance. So, um, I ask you all to be um, self-disciplined, and I'll, I'll do the same in keeping to the schedule. I'll, I'll remind you of that from time to time. And again, remember, uh, we can't nail all these issues um, to their final conclusion, but you'll have the opportunity to do that as time goes on. A little framework on how we might chat today. Um, Daniel Yankelovich, that name mean anything to anybody around here? He was a guy that did a lot of survey work, and he, he's written a lot on how, he's, um, in a political environment, how different groups come together, um, how they achieve a working consensus, if not 100% agreement, and he called it the magic of dialogue. I guarantee you that by noon today, the magic of dialogue will work if everybody contributes. You won't agree on everything, but you'll be further down the road. So all contribute. I know there's some introverts at the table. Um, that doesn't mean they, they want to be quiet, but they just may be oriented that way. I'm one of them. Um, so if, uh, if you haven't spoken up, I may well say, David, uh, what's your take on this issue? And if you've got one at the moment, deliver. And if you don't, you pick the introvert. Right? I, <laughs> I kind of saw that, but <laughs> the case, the, uh, that, that wasn't, by, uh, wasn't quite by accident. Anyway. The second thing I'd ask you to, uh, to buy into is, uh, uh, have you, any of you familiar with that little book by those two guys from Harvard who've done very well with it called Getting to Yes? Getting to Yes. The name tells it all. Did you ever see the movie Snakes on a Plane? That tells the whole story too. Anyway, Getting to Yes. How to get to yes. One of their recommendations is be hard on the issues. When, when you say, uh, John, I just can't agree with you on that because of X, Y, and Z but easy on, the, on each other. You're a wonderful human being. Okay, so just you keep it friendly, which I think won't be hard for you to do. It's probably the way you operate anyway. And finally, let Terry facilitate. 
And what that means on a, on a practical level is give me some signal that you want to get in on the conversation. Pull your ear, finger, eyebrows, whatever it takes, and I'll, you know, I'll respond to you. But be patient. Don't just jump in right away. There may be a couple that have something to say ahead of time, and they had their hand up a little bit earlier. All the viewpoints will get out. Don't worry about it. Uh, just if you can you know, kind of restrain yourself a little bit there. Does this work? Everybody? Good. Okay. I don't think I'm scoring too well on asking you if you're familiar with, um, uh, with uh, popular or once popular figure, figures. Father Guido Sarducci. Yes. <laughs> okay, Father. He was uh, a Saturday Night Live uh, icon who specialized in what he called the five-minute university. Uh, this will make you feel great, believe me, if you, if you don't recall it. He said, uh, I'll teach you in five minutes what you remember five years after you graduate from the university. Okay. Um, the um, inventory management, uh, I'll, I'll, what is it, uh, last in, first out, or first in, last out, or something like that, or Spanish, como esta? Okay, give me 20 bucks. You just, you just learned what, uh, what you would remember 20 years after your Spanish class. Um, I'm calling now, I'm gonna ask you to introduce yourselves quickly, but not with the five minute university, with the one minute university. And uh, Julia, because I don't like to spring surprises, could we start with you, but just in a moment. Uh, the name you like to go by, profession or life work, why you serve, and something uh, not widely known Yet, of course, it will be once you, once you announce it. Uh, I'll, 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 I'll uh, guide it. I go by Terry. Uh, what I do for my life work is what you see. I've been the head of a couple of systems, was faculty member, blah blah blah. Uh, why I do it? I come from a military family, and I'm a Vietnam guy. And I frankly felt that the military wasn't for me, and they probably agreed. Helping the country is much better off if we can beat them by being smart then we can beat them by uh, go, uh, going to battle with them. And frankly, the work you do for people in Missouri and wherever they come from, that's serving our country. Not yet widely known, uh, I uh, live in the state of Maine in the summertime, and in the wintertime I live on a catamaran sailboat in Florida, uh, between South Florida and the Bahamas. That's me, and that was probably a minute. Julia. Uh, I go by Julia, my family calls me Julie. I'll pretty much answer to anything in between. Uh, I'm an attorney. I manage uh, litigation for Express Scripts <clears throat> here on the UMSL campus. Um, I'm serving because education means a lot to me. The state of Missouri means a lot to me. It's my home. And it's funny, I wasn't in the, in the uh, military, but I was raised by a Marine. And um, if you came into my house, you would see it's family, uh, city, state, country sort of as my artwork as you enter, and it's strategically put there because that's very important to, to me and my family. Um, not widely known, I love to cook, I love to eat, uh, and I'm very passionate about uh, animals. Wow, thank you. David? Uh, my name's David, I'm a lawyer. Um, I'm almost focused exclusively on, on uh, trying lawsuits. Uh, I agreed to serve because I've always felt very connected and close to the University of Missouri where I got uh, both degrees and frankly because I thought I had seen a decline in what the university was over 20 mm. years and was mm. hopeful that I might be able to contribute something to make the university what I think it should be and will be again which is a great uh, university. Uh, what is not yet widely known about me is in my immediate family every member of my family including my wife can do more chin-ups than me. <laughs> <laughs> More generous to you? More, more chin-ups than I can. More kick and do more chin-ups. <laughs> Terrific. Thank you, David. My name is Jamie Farmer. I'm from Jefferson City and have a long history with the University of Missouri and very proud of this system and school. I went to Mizzou and Columbia and love the university. Uh, my professional life, I've um, worked for my family's business, but I've successfully started a few businesses within those, and so I, I'm passionate about branding and how you mm. make something grow and how you build teams. I, I, I think what, whatever the business is, it's about having a great team and buy-in from everybody on board, and so that seems to be what I'm most passionate about lately. And why do I serve on this? Because I think it's a, 
amazing opportunity to make a big difference, um, not me personally, but we have an amazing opportunity to make a big difference in this state and in this country. I think we have a, a gym here at, in the state of Missouri and, and a, just a great opportunity to better position ourselves in the nation as a, as a great, well-regarded institution. And what is not widely known about me <clears throat> this is silly, and I can't believe I'm going to say this, but I have two cats, and their names are Mitch and Randy, and I, I just love those two little guys, and that's probably really silly that I'm, I'm secretly a cat lady. <laughs> no, no Rich or, or Randy's on the board, I can no see, Mitch so that's a plus. Yeah, thank you. John? So I go by John, and I am a lawyer by training and was a trial lawyer for, I guess, 30 years or so. And now I'm a mediator, so I try to resolve mm. disputes rather than create them. I'm serving because I'm a first-gen grad of uh, the university on the Columbia campus, as are almost a dozen of my family. And I, I like to give back uh, because of what it's done for me in my life and my family. Uh, what's not widely known is that I go to China frequently mm. and collect street China art. China art of great quality has become almost as valuable as European art. So I don't collect that, but I have a, a catalog of things that I pick up on the street or in the vendors. And Very uh, interesting. I enjoy that. Very Thank you, John. Steve, you don't get off the hook here. Come on, go quick. Uh, my name is Steve Owens. I uh, am the general counsel here at the university. Uh, I have coming up on my 10th year anniversary in January. Before that, I was in private practice in Kansas City for about 27 years. Uh, I've been privileged to also serve as interim president and interim chancellor while I've been here at the university. Um, I left my private practice, which I loved, because I had an opportunity to uh, work in education, and my belief is that after faith, education is the big uh, changer in the world. Um, what most people probably don't know about me is I'm an ordained elder in the Presbyterian Church. Well, Thank you very much. Mr. Minister. Chairman. Ordained minister. minister. Not a minister. Ordained elder. Elder. Yeah. Uh, Marcy Graham. Uh, my name is Maurice, but my father was Maurice also, so they always call me Marcy. Uh, I'm a lawyer. Uh, long relationship with University of Missouri, uh, only as a curator now, but uh, long involvement with the law school. I uh, chaired uh, two of their major fundraising campaigns over the years. Uh, why do I serve? Uh, I love the university. I, I, most of my time is with the campus in Columbia, but I've uh, grown to love all of the other campuses and, and uh, uh, want to do everything that I can do to improve our uh, wonderful system of higher education. Uh, uh, I, I can't imagine a greater responsibility than being a curator. Uh, Things that people don't know about me, uh, I used to skydive, mm. and at age 15, I had a mohawk haircut. <laughs> <laughs> thank nice you. See that. Thank you very much. Mr. President. Oh, thank you. Uh, my given name is Che Moon Young, uh, but people call me Moon Choi, and my profession is I believe I'm in the business of helping to support students and faculty to reach their potential. And I'm a product of public education from Akron, Ohio, to Chicago, to Urbana-Champaign. And I want to be able to give back in my role to make a difference to students and to faculty members. What's not widely known about me is I am probably the world's biggest fan of Les Mis. And I'll go anywhere oh. in the world to watch performances, oh. even high school performances. And I have a collection of cowboy boots that I can now finally wear because I'm in Missouri and not in Connecticut. <laughs> Thank you very much. John. My name is John. I go by John. Uh, some call me Sonny, but you can call me whatever. Uh, I have been in the investment business for a number of years. I've had my own company for the last 20. Uh, most of my work is in the pension business. Uh, why serve? Um, I was asked to serve, <laughs> uh, but it ties in, uh, I'm a graduate of Mizzou, uh, my wife is Mizzou, <clears throat> all of my wife's family has ties, uh, what's not yet widely known, kind of known, uh, I have a brother who's a graduate from 
S and T. I have a brother who's a graduate from UMKC. I have a brother who is a master's from Mizzou and is now the coach at UMSL. Hmm. So I have been on campuses before being a curator. I have uh, been around the places. And when in times, I will talk to each of my brothers about if they're contributing enough to their <laughs> institutions as alone. <laughs> Terrific. Thank you, John. Jeff. My name's Jeff. Um, I've been in the investment business for 25 years. Um, why I serve is I believe that the University of Missouri is a very important part of the state of Missouri. And I want to try to do my small part to help turn it around. Um, what's not widely known about me, I, I absolutely love to travel. I think about it all the time, but most of my travel consists of I-44 and I-70. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Phil. Yeah, I'm Phil Snowden, and uh, everybody calls me Phil, or most people do, and when they put Philip on my name tag, I, didn't, I really don't like that very well. I don't know why, but I just like to be known as Phil. And. Uh, I practiced law for many years. I was in the legislature almost 20 years. That's where I met David Steelman, and I'm still trying to get him in line. <laughs> it's a hard thing to do, but we're getting closer all the time. Uh, and I've also, I, I, you say, why did you serve? Well, I remember walking on the campus uh, in 1956 as a freshman, uh, uh, thinking I was going to play football at Missouri, which I did, and that was a great experience. But I fell, fell in love with the campus at that time, and since then, really, it's been kind of a 60-plus year love affair with the university. I've helped several presidents and chancellors through various issues in the legislature as well. Uh, and when asked to serve, I felt like this was a, a great opportunity to come full circle uh, for the University of Missouri and try to give something back and hopefully learn something along the way, which I have. Uh, as to what you don't know about me, I don't know there's anything out there that people don't know about me. Uh, I will tell you this, that I met my wife, uh, she was actually at Stevens, uh, and uh, I went over with my one of my fraternity brothers, and he said, I want you to meet this girl that I'm dating. And I said, I've been to Stevens many times, I don't need to go to Stevens. So I go to Stevens, this girl walks down the stairs, I saw her and I thought, oh man, she is a beauty. And later I married her and have been with her 56 plus years now, and three daughters, two of them Mizzou grads. Anyway, she's a great woman and, and that's something that uh, we kind of love at first sight. Oh, terrific. Thank you, Phil. Thank you. Daryl. All right. Daryl Chapman. Um, I go by Daryl. Uh, my profession, uh, I'm an attorney, general counsel at the Missouri Department of Agriculture. Why I serve, um, I feel like I owe everything in my life to MU. Um, having the opportunity to go to college and um, all the opportunities that have been presented to me since I graduated, I owe that all to MU and the faculty, staff, and people that I met while at MU. I have very close ties to a lot of the people there, and um, a lot of them are like family to me. And so it's, it's like coming home to be able to serve on this board, and I'm so honored to be here. Um, not widely known about me. Um, I'm one generation from um, the Pruitt Igo housing projects oh, really? downtown St. Louis. Yeah. I'm proud of that. And my yeah. my father, um, my grandfather raised eight kids in the housing projects. He sent his kids. He he worked numerous jobs, um, and he sent his kids. Gave all of his eight children a private school education. They um, sent me to private school here in in St. Louis. I grew up about five minutes from here in Jennings, and um, um, and so. When I um, think about that background, you know, humble beginnings and, and being able to do what I've done um, with the help of MU, um, it just makes me very proud to be here. So that's something that's probably not widely known, so I'll use that. Thank you, Darren. Right. Thank you very much. Courtney. Hi, I'm Courtney Lauer. I go by Courtney. I guess I, my profession and life work is right now I'm focusing on getting my master's, my LLM through the law school on Mizzou's campus. However, I'm also an attorney for the state. Um, why I serve is I believe that everybody possesses unique traits within them and if you bring those forward together in a collaborative motion you can accomplish way more than you can single-handedly and so I believe that public service is important 
Um, and when I was given this opportunity, I was um, very grateful at the chance to be able to work with everybody sitting in here to um, serve the students of the system. Something that's not yet widely known about me, um, it's kind of hard, I'm an open book most of the time, um, but if given the choice between mountains or beach, I would choose mountains any day of the week. <laughs> Thank you for that. Um, yeah, you won't be surprised to learn that I often ask boards uh, questions like these when doing this. Uh, let me tell you what sets you apart from just about everyone else that I've heard, and that is the combination of head and heart that come here. You've almost all got an emotional, familiar, familial tie to the university. I mean, you're motivated to be here. It isn't just something the governor asked you to, to do. By the same token, you represent in your professions and in your disciplines strengths that the board needs. Legislative experience, governmental experience, law, finance, big time athletics, either at the collegiate or, or level or, or, or on the professional level. You've got the right stuff, the right combination for this thing to really exceed expectations. So, and not all boards have that. Some of them are on there because it's just an honor and they wanted to get there. Virginia, you know, kind of has a little bit of, of that element. But you guys have the right stuff to make a difference here and it's a pleasure for me to work with you. Okay, um, first part of the conversation. I think we're ahead of the game. Core mission of the board. If you can agree on this, then you'll know the fundamental directions you want to go in. It's so, so important. Based on my conversations, I think they're, I don't think you're all that far apart, but it's a matter of articulating it to yourself and, and getting there. At some point, you may want to memorialize this conversation. It's being recorded, notes are being taken, and so on. Uh, and it becomes uh, the, the, uh, the board's mission the board's commitment, something like that, that you can hand on to your successors so that the positive culture continues. But for now, we're not gonna focus on all of the details so much. I just mentioned a couple of ideas here to stimulate the conversation and then I'll pipe down and ask you to take over until about 11 or 10, 15. Um, all of you, so many of you with a legal background know the, know the meaning of fiduciary. You know, holding the, this institution, and can we get rid of that echo a little bit, or is that something I'm doing? Okay, <laughs> thank you. Um, uh, holding this institution in trust, and that bespeaks of cautious, <coughs> caution, carefulness, and so on, uh, prudence, a very careful thing. Um, but you also need to have a future orientation. Sitting at the table this morning, listening to, I think, an anthropologist faculty member said, we know the world is changing. And I detected some anxiety in that. How do we go forward together in a way that's not protective of interest, but productive for the, for the university? So the fiduciary part's important, but so is the future orientation. The academy, the academy has a culture unto itself that dates from the 11th century. Uh, people outside the academy, which by and large is myself these days, in spite of my degree in 18th century British lit, uh, is the MBA side. That's the enterprise culture. It's about productivity, it's about results, it's focused on quantitative measures, competition. How do you kind of work realizing that there are genuine differences between the way the academics look at the world and their profession and their value and, the, and, and uh, what is uh, what one uh, a thoughtful speaker described as the <coughs> ethos of American capitalism that characterizes our larger culture. Um, leadership with the president, that's really kind of what this whole meeting is about. So those are just ideas. You wanna bounce off them, fine. If you have an independent viewpoint, fine too. What is, what is your view, core mission of the board? I thought about doing a round table, but I think instead we'll just see who comments and pick up other ones. Well, I'll give it a shot Thank first. You, I think the when I think about our mission, I think of I think of three prongs. Um, one collaboration. Um, how do we bring our four campuses together to unify them um, into accomplishing efficiencies and and serving our students better? Um, second, we've got to be innovative, and that means drive research. Um, 
whether it be at MUS and T, UMKC, UMSL, um, and then, um, and this is in no particular order, we got to educate, you know, and make sure that our students' experience is superior and the best that we can provide. So, we start there with what I think the core Give me principles. Give middle one again. Um, innovative. Innovate. And that, that goes to research and driving research at the university. Okay. Separate thoughts, thoughts triggered by Daryl's comments, and I'm going to ask the president to participate on, in this when he feels that uh, it'd be the, the thing to do. Now, David, you look particularly thoughtful at the moment. Can I? <laughs> That's an act. <laughs> I would say that the core mission of the board is to work with the president to achieve a vision uh, that is so stark so compelling that it, the vision moves the university into the future. I did a little work with the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, and their vision was to be the best place in the world to teach, learn, and discover. I'm not saying you should adopt that, but they, they're you know, a world-class institution and frankly a very strong system, and they had that kind of overarching. I kind of think of the board as um, needing to be involved in strategy, lockstep with the president, have the administration's back, um, set the strategy and go. Is that last comment? Set the strategy together and then, and then go, execute. After we do this kind of broad overview, I'm going to come back to, so we might be thinking about what would be some bullets underneath that? How do you make actualize that, that role? And Kenny, the ever-changing uh, uh, set mm, strategy mm, focusing, mm. I mean, I look at the board, the mission focusing on key issues, uh, key policy issues, but sometimes on an ongoing board, as many years as some people have been on this one, and the new people, those policies will change ongoing. Uh, the, the, the breakfast we just had and, and, and the voices that were shared, uh, obviously there's a change in higher education. We know it's coming. So the, so the issues that, that David or John or Phil did four years ago or three are got to be different than today. So, I mean, Again, to me, the mission, what are the key policy issues for our board, with our president, uh, and then for the campuses? Um, thank you for that. A lot of people would say, uh, it's not coming, it's here. Yeah. Um, talking with a board member who was a, a venture a capitalist investor in Silicon Valley, and he said, the best of you guys are at the beginning of the 21st century. Um, Gary, I like, I like the statement you made to start with about, you know, let's, uh, let's look at what the result is we want. And if we can do that collectively as a board and with the administration, the president, figure out what it is we want to do, what, what, the, what the end result's going to be, yeah. and then let the president and the administration carry that out and not get in their way unless it looks like they're going off track and uh, continue to communicate with them and collaborate with them as we go along, but certainly don't try to impose our thinking on them. Once we've decided what it is we want, let's get out of their way and let them do it. Um, thank you, Phil. I, and I think I'll probably pick up later and ask you to, to comment on that. I, I think your perspectives would seem to be the what is something we need to, what, what do we want to do? What results do we want? Uh, something to concentrate on first. The how is more up to them. And I think there are probably some curators who think, no, let's talk about, talk about the how anyway, because we know a thing or two. And um, that's, you know, let's kind of make sure that the how is, at least in our understanding, is going to lead to accomplishing the what. But it, it, it's, um, it's a great way to frame up the issue. Thank you. Yeah, Courtney. 
Not as the sole mission, but I believe a core component of the mission should be that listening component uh -huh. of the board. Yeah. Um, and not just with students, but all constituents and stakeholders that make up the UM system. Uh, I, I also, you know, uh, what, um, failure ha is an orphan and success has many parents. Um, whoever dreamed up that session this morning was spot on. I don't see how you lose it all by having that dialogue with faculty members who I thought were um, uh, very well spoken and sharp and I would expect great in their disciplines. Yeah. Mr. Chairman. A little different thought of mine is uh, mission for the board is to help uh, the leaders of the institution create, uh, create an institution, an environment, uh, I think in terms of product, I think in terms of product, that being the students, that being the graduates of, of our four campuses, but to help the leaders of our university uh, create a campuses, four campuses, that will produce graduates who are going to uh, change the world. We, uh, we, we deal with so many issues now that uh, I want to be able to produce leaders and people who will make this world a safer and better place. Gosh knows we need it. That, um as I mentioned, I come from a military family, and it's, um, things look dicier now than they have in a while. John. So I would put this in the triangularity of the shared governance concept, uh, that we are representing the citizens of Missouri mm. to interface with um, the administration and with the faculty to develop and implement a strategic plan. and. Um, help oversee from a fiduciary standpoint, but also creativity uh, to adapt to the change which is occurring ever more quickly. I'm really glad you brought up both the fiduciary thing, which, which is um, are the operations as efficient, uh, legal, uh, thoughtful as they can be, but also th that ain't enough. That's just sort of a static thing, the creativity of the future for the citizens, very nice. Terry, it could also <clears throat> a part of the core, yeah. uh, not to be, not to be the voice of the university, but to me the core mission. I don't know when I think about our board is to be a voice because we have nine people mm -hmm. from nine different parts of the state. Uh, we've talked about messaging. We'll talk about messaging. And I and I and I sit here and think, okay, all of us have. <coughs> in our own walks of life, we're all individuals, we've all done certain things and recognized amongst the people we're part of, but we can all be part of, when I think about it, to me the mission now amongst all of us is to be a voice um, in this state. Let me ask a follow-up to that if I can, John. Um, do you see that role as being kind of ambassadors for the university or, or if you have an independent view from your other board members, is it sort of speaking out on John's take? No, I, no, not independent. We're, we're all independent. We're all individuals. But uh, I mean, our board needs to speak as one, uh, and we have one voice. But that doesn't mean we're not ambassadors in in how great our system and our four schools are. And I think all of us probably would share when we walk amongst wherever we are higher education, you know, there are shots taken at higher education. Yeah, yeah. And in our case, the university, right? And so lack of knowledge amongst general public about what universities do, and we've already talked what research and all that is. I don't, I don't see it as a board, we can't have our own individual voice, that'd be disastrous. Uh, you know, the chairman speaks as one voice, and that's what it should be. But I do see as a mission, as a board member, uh, what what I can do where I live and where I walk uh, could really it, it's it, it's a difference and it can be part of what I think the mission as a board member is not to speak differently than what I should say yeah I, I don't want an opinion about uh, something that happened but I I want to have a voice that says here's here's the great things that are going on and and I'm not so sure that shouldn't be part of the mission of of all of us where we are because we're all in different parts of the state. 
the, um, there's a, another bromide in this business is the chair speaks for the board and the president speaks for the university. But I um, like the point you actually brought up earlier in the day, people get athletics. Um, research, what the heck is that? And to, to make the, um, there's a bit of a dilemma. Do we try to describe the university as it's conceived of by the academics? Um, and overturn the fact that in a, I think it was a Pew survey, 70% of Republicans don't think the higher education is doing its job, and almost as many Democrats share that view. Um, on the one hand, or do we find the vocabulary, the language that'll translate what the, you know, what the academics do to the common person? We found that in Maine and elsewhere to be the economic side, frankly. Um, but I, I, very well taken. People agree with that ambassador idea and finding the message. Is that part of the role of the board? Or have another point of view entirely? David. Well, it's not entirely a different point of view, but it, but it, but it, it is somewhat. Uh, going through the events that we went through in the past, and I, th I felt like our desire to speak with one voice did not fully represent to the people of Missouri who were paying attention the discussions and the debates that were going on within the board and I always felt that that worked to our disadvantage and, and I think sometimes that works to the disadvantage of education and how we are perceived. Uh, uh, it, I think the world has changed. I think that the public and, and most of us are much less trusting of monolithic uh, organizations and I think as a board that is this small we should be able to have discussions and spirited discussions in respectful manners. I don't think, I think you have seen dysfunctional boards where people go out and backbite other board members, which I think is absolutely contrary. I think that we can go a little too far and have gone too far the other way, speaking uh, and saying the board speaks through the chairman and the university speaks through the president. I think we have to be very careful and knowledgeable about it, but I believe that a discussion and a debate and expressing that there are differences in policy opinions is actually a positive thing for the university and that we have become too focused on controlling an individual statement to the extent that we no longer communicate with the people of this state or of this country the way that we should. And I'll say one thing, I, I think that, that people would like knowing that we have different perspectives and different values on certain things here and that we can state that in a respectful way and be an example to a society that no longer does that, but that we don't do that when <coughs> we don't speak up honestly and express those differences. Very interesting. Other, other or similar perspectives to the one David just laid out so cogently? I, I just want to echo that because you know when you reflect back on the 2015 events, um, I'm sure this board had all kinds of different viewpoints. And I think it would have been important for different constituencies around the state, let's say African Americans, to understand that people cared about, you know, their, what was going on on campus. And if you don't have that, you know, vigorous debate at the public session or have other people speaking out about it, giving different viewpoints, I think you do look like, you know, we're not even having the conversation. And so that's a misperception, but I think that board behavior, board communication, I think can improve that and letting our constituents know around the state that we do care about different groups of people, different folks, and, and that, um, and so we just have to carefully craft it of who's gonna be speaking and who's gonna be saying what. Don't backbite each other, have some ground rules there, but I think we can get it done. And having our public sessions, you know, um, embrace debate, embrace disagreement. We may not have, have um, votes that are all, you know, nine zero, you know, and I think, I think that could be important at some, for some issues. John, do you want to? No, I, you know what, I agree, because if you go back two years ago, um, if you had one voice from the board and, and, and you had nine different opinions in, in the communities we all serve and come from, uh, there were vast views of what happened, right? Everybody had an opinion. But if you lived, if you were in the UMSL campus in this area, Right, it's a little different than being in Sykeston, Missouri, or yeah. I mean, so so it probably would have been beneficial to have have more 
maybe the board out and about or at different functions that you could at least hear because there wasn't anything said. And now also know you're doing is guessing. But I'll go back to Daryl. It, it, it has, the message still will have to be that we honor everybody's opinion and it's good discussion and it's, and it's things that we probably don't do in today's world because we have the far fringes are the loudest and no one just has a good debate. And we talked this morning, David and Phil, they were in legislators on the opposite side but agreed 80% of the time, they said, back in the day. They just had discussion and yeah. debate. Okay. Julia? Can I follow up? I don't want to, because this is particularly important to me, and, and, and I, I don't want to go on at length too much, but I also think that the idea that you only have one voice ends up being a Band-Aid for an organization that doesn't really have the trust for each other that they should. I think an organization that is able to express <coughs> differing views publicly and concerns is actually an organization that has to develop more trust because if we're going to have a discussion or a debate or Daryl and I are going to disagree on something, we actually have to trust each other more to be able to do that than to sit alone and people not know where, where we differ. Uh, I think that is a change. I'll say I recognize it's dangerous. I recognize that operating like that causes some fear and trepidation but I will suggest that you can't get the thrill of the high wire if you always use it next. Julia, Julia, and then Jamie. Well, I, I, Thank you. I vigorously de uh, agree in debate and, and it being um, the foundation for thought. Um, and I think we have to challenge each other respectfully. And I know we all have a lot of respect for one another, so I don't think that's a challenge. Um, but George Paz, who is a um, fairly well-known graduate of this institution, um, always had the mantra when he was the CEO, don't have an opinion outside of this room. You bring it up here within the senior staff, within that management team, and you have it out. And uh, at the end of the day, there may be a decision that uh, is made that you don't necessarily agree with, but then you leave that room in support of that decision. And that's how I feel about it. I, I, want, I want those different viewpoints heard, and I could probably say outside of here, you know, that wasn't the way I voted, you know I, how I voted, but that was the decision of the board, and I'm gonna support that. Okay. Jamie? In, in support of both those comments, I think that's very important, but I think what's most important is that we do have a clear, going back to the beginning, mission or vision, so outsiders can say, hey, they're just not arguing with no place the boat's going. At least we're arguing and, and debating with one another with a purpose, because we all believe in the same vision and, and where we want this thing to go. And, and that's what I think is most important, and, and what we should really focus on is what is that vision, so we always have a, a place to circle back to when we're having heated conversations. Let me just ask a little follow-up for clarification. Um, are you underlining the importance of the, the message being where we're going, why this is an organization we're supporting, as opposed to having your conversation dictated by external events and reaction to them? Yes, I mean, I think in light of, I've said this a couple of times, and this is just an opinion, I think Missouri is such a humble state, and I think that's a really great quality, but I also think there's time for us to really cheer and give ourselves a pat on the back and, and voice loudly all the great things that we do do and the great things we're planning on doing instead of always being reactive is get out in front of it a little bit. So I don't know if that answers your question, but it's a vision on where we're going and who we are and who we're continuing to be. Yep. In our phone calls, a couple of people mentioned something along that line of, of where we don't, we're not expressing the positive agenda that makes sense to the people of Missouri, which doesn't mean you're not going to disagree among each other. It's sort of a separate issue from what, what David stimulated. But it's got to be a real, oh, I'm sorry. Go, it's go, be a, maybe uh, the chair and then over to Daryl. Oh, I'm sorry, Marcy, go ahead. No, I, I, no, I didn't I, see I, the just, uh, I, I think, uh, and I know that AGB and I know that uh, Everywhere we read about obligations of curators or trustees or regents, it is that uh, the board speak with only one voice, that be the, be the chair. Uh, I think that was probably uh, 
a good rule earlier. I think it's unrealistic in this day and time uh, when you have, you know, in this case, nine very competent, thoughtful uh, people who are respectful of, of one another, uh, that uh, it, it presents very little danger to, uh, to, to go outside that mantra of only one voice speaking for the board. Uh, this board's a good example. Now, you, you don't air your dirty laundry outside of the board. I mean, and, and, and we, we don't do that. But uh, it, it, it presents very little danger for board members to have different thoughts, opinions on, on important things. Uh, and all of us have the ability to say it in a manner that it doesn't look like an argument that we're airing publicly for some sort of an advantage mm -hmm. or to carry out some agenda. So I, I, think it's, I don't think it's harmful at all. I, if done right. I particularly appreciate the way you say the world has changed for trustees. Uh, what made, might, might have made sense 20 years ago, uh, that sort of discipline, you know, stonewall, we, once we've decided, maybe should be rethought so long as it, the issue doesn't become uh, gore, bored in disarray. You know, exactly. Um, or the headline doesn't become sterile. Yeah, and I'm just echoing that, you know, and Marcy said some of the things I was going to say, but yeah, no board, we don't want to present that. What's the fine line we can walk between um, doing what, you know, kind of what Jamie and Julia, it's a combination of what folks here have said, how do we make it clear that, that yeah, this wasn't an easy decision, you know, this was something that, you know, was heavily debated, just communicating that, different points of view were shared, but this is the direction we're going, and, and, and I support my, my board in that decision. So just echoing what you guys have said. Um, I don't know if Jamie wants to pick up on this or not, but Daryl's question seemed to be, that sounds good. How do we get to that point mm -hmm. that whatever we do express is measured, respectful of other members, and the board doesn't become the story? And, and let me add to that, because we do um, we do a lot of conversation. We have a lot of conversations before we should show up at a board meeting. Yeah. And a lot of times, there's a lot of debate on the phone, you know. And then um, I've even talked to you know some of our administrative staff, and I said, hey, you don't mind if we kind of rehash this debate? I know we just had it, now we're at resolution, but we've got to rehash it at the meeting so that people can see that I'm at least asking the questions, you know. And I think that's that's a good good way to go. Yeah. But but I don't like the idea of. You know, we, we do all the phone conversations and I've got this question, then we resolve it, and then we come to a meeting and have no discussion on it when that's not really, and I don't want the, pers the public to even perceive us as being that way. So, um, and I, I hate reiterating questions and debate. Ryan, I, I tell Ryan this all the time, don't mind, if, don't, you know, please, you know, don't mind if I rehash the same argument because I want people to know that these are the questions we were thinking of. So, because I, th I think that's good for people to see. John? <clears throat> We're a little bit astray from your from your uh, topic here, I think, um, but I guess I would uh, speak about caution in terms of um, having a divergent board that frequently, uh, frequently. is in yeah. conflict. My, my personal belief is that reasonable people, if given good dialogue and if working independently of thought, will reach agreement over time. And uh, there have been times in recent years on this board when we've had some strong disagreement, but usually have ended up being supportive of the decision, even if some of us were reluctant, reluctant on a point. So I think the default is we ought to develop a strong consensus and mm. then be supportive of it. Uh, but if you feel strongly, then a minority report is fine. Uh, but the default ought to be, let's work it through. I think because of the way in which our board is appointed, it, it has a danger of becoming politicized. And I wasn't observing that closely 10 years ago or 12 years ago, but I believe it was a very fractured board and was unseemly and unproductive for the university. Uh, the people that we have on this board, I don't think will be doing that. And I hope that we are able to reach a strong consensus um, and not have, you know, public uh, second guessing to the det detriment of the university. Uh, late David Broder liked to say that reporters are fight promoters. Um, and it's not something we want to 
uh, play into it. Jamie, you, you've got a background in marketing and branding and that kind of thing. Is that, do I have that? Yeah. Do you have any, any wisdom at this point? Don't feel compelled <laughs> you, at the moment you don't. I mean, I, I agree with, with John there that I, I hope that we can come to a consensus, but I'm going to go back to my original statement is yeah. I, I like to see what our vision is, and then that will help us all focus on what that, how we can get to a consensus. Sometimes I feel lost on, on what the vision is and what we should be routinely communicating out to the public with they, so they know what our vision is at a university. Mm -hmm. Let me shift uh, to a, a different issue that was brought up, the issue of strategy and your role in it. But the re um, I personally thought this conversation was very productive. You're not all that far apart on it. You're not in total agreement. You can find other occasions to fashion a modus vivendi that makes sense to people and doesn't turn friends into enemies. Um, and I guess I would say, just from somebody who watches a lot of this, uh, the, the chairman is right, the world has changed. And, and the sort of lock arms, no matter what, is uh, less expected or acceptable than some very respectful, carefully crafted, as Daryl said, recognition of difference of opinion. Sometimes it cools it down out there. Yeah, that's a tough issue. We talked about it. We don't all agree. My perspective is this, but I support the board and my, co you know, that. Mm -hmm. Something along that line. Media training if you, might be a, a way to go. But let's come back to the strategy thing in about the 15 minutes we have left on this, emphasizing this isn't the last word on it. What are your thoughts, um, Julia, on the board's role in setting strategy? Um, when should it occur? How detailed should it be? When does it shift off? And maybe the, the president will comment on this in a few minutes. Does it shift off to the president? Just um, how much hands-on from the board, how much strategic direction versus the strategy, however you want to approach this. I don't know if I have a, a solid view of how it should work on this board. I think it depends okay. a little bit. Um, but I think that the, the two, um, I think the board, <clears throat> not only through uh, you know, it, it, the entire collective board, but also through its committees as the work arms of the board, yeah. um, need to have a clear mission and direction of what they are to accomplish. I think that should be done um, at the outset of a year and say, what do we want to accomplish this year? Um, and, and have some specific, you know, charters for those committees that, you know, are, are much more detailed than what we have in the collected rules and the bylaws. Um, and I think that that has to be, I don't know that, that I'm saying chicken or egg here, yeah. but I think that that has to work in a very collaborative process with the president. I think those dialogues need to be uh, early and often with each of the, the chairs of the committees at, at the very least, um, so that if you increase that communication, um, I think coming up with what the strategy is going to be becomes a little bit easier. I don't know who necessarily sets it, but I think we could probably improve upon that. And um, you know, I see the board as you say it's the perfect size, and that may be true. Um, but I think that there's an nine opportunity. Nine to twelve. Nine to twelve is a good size. Yeah. There may be an opportunity to engage other subject matter expertise that we don't currently have on the board. I think there's an opportunity to engage those folks on some of these committees, um, just kind of like the the health system committee. Um, you know, uh, get some CPAs and some CFOs on the, you know, finance and and audit committees. And <clears throat> I, I think that when you have a lot of um, folks who have that expertise within the field that you're you're governing I think as a as when you're governing you're trying to find those folks who can help um, I guess what I'm saying it's not autocratic and it's not here's what I think and I was appointed to this board so here's what we're going to do right I think you have an obligation on behalf of the entity to find the folks who know what they're doing both as a board member as a president and I know I know moon consults with everyone um, but I think that you need that, that dialogue and to, to really flesh out some of those issues together. And then I think the strategy's more easily created together. Okay. Terry, do you recommend that we 
as a board come up with a formal mission statement? Um, or do you think that's do you think that's necessary? Something in something in writing? What do you what do you think? Yeah. S something we put on a website. <laughs> you know? The short answer is yes. Not because the mission statement is so important, but the process of getting there and resolving, uh, or at least becoming a deeper understanding of the conversation you just had. Yeah, because that's I just see that relating to everything is going to flow from that. You know, our strategy moving forward, and so if you recommend it, maybe. Um, maybe that's something we could and do. And I, I, I think it, it takes more work than one would see would think. Part of it is okay. What is the vocabulary we're going to use when we don't agree going into the public? How do we try to use the magic of dialogue to come to consensus? That's different from what kind of system do we want five years down the road, and what actions do we take take now? If I can do maybe just a quick illustration of that, and I'd ask the president to comment in just a a second. Um, <coughs> Let's see if I can find this um, quickly. You got a lot of slides there. <laughs> you never know when you're going to need this stuff, you know what I mean? <clears throat> ah. This might be the best one. What kind of system do we want? This is one way to frame up the strategy question. And I just put these up as possible choices. And I'm going to you know, ask the president to, to comment as he wishes. Loose confederation. Four schools kind of loosely connected, do what you want. You know, we, uh, we represent you in the legislature if you decide not to enrun us, and that's one. Corporate, frankly, much more centralized, shared, not only shared services, but centralized decision making, somewhat more autocratic in some ways. And that is probably the general trend in the country today toward more centralization. A political alliance. We put together a budget, it gives every baby a lollipop, and that's what we go after. Okay, I used to lead a system that had that <laughs> quality to it. Um, one university, same standards for tenure and everything else, expectations, uh, central services, HR policies, computer systems, one university, four locations. Okay, I think the University of Indiana once had the motto, one university, many doors. Um, and then the um, this final uh, comment, there's a, a quote attributed to a, to a, a second century Roman called, um, after we reorganized and reconfigured and restructured everything, they called it reform. And it wasn't, of course. Petronius Arbiter was the guy's name. So um, <laughs> yeah. uh, don't do too much. OK, with that kind of <laughs> broad right. base, Mr. So, President. The most successful strategic plans at a university must have ownership of the individuals who are going to be implementing it as well as advocating for it. So if we were to develop a strategic plan that ultimately needs to be approved by the Board of Curators two weeks before the vote is taken and saying, well, here it is, I think that would be an approach that would be unfair to the curators, obviously. So getting their input and their wisdom early is gonna be very important. So back in July of 2017 of this year, we had a retreat focused str strategically on what is the vision of the University of Missouri system and what are the compacts that we must all agree to to say when we focus on these compacts that follows the vision that we've established, then we're gonna become a premier premier land-grant university. And so that process has started in, in, Jan in uh, July. And as we move forward, we are going to get very deep, deep input from the curators. And I've been speaking to Marcy and David about this. And uh, we're going to have iterations of reports that come in that get feedback from the curators as we go through this process. So I see the role of the curators because they ultimately have to not only approve it, but also advocate for it. 
advocate for it in the private sector, advocate for it in Jeff City and so forth. That, that's gonna be a very deep integration that we're looking for. And, uh, and so your input is gonna be valued and appreciated as you move forward. Uh, would you be uh, comfortable, Mr. President, at this point, giving a couple of bullets under specifics almost underneath that heading of this uh, premier exceptional so institution? We're How gonna, the, five, now and then? the five compacts that we're going to be pursuing, one is in student success. And the subcompacts are how do we increase affordability? How do we increase high quality education that results in uh, higher retention rates, higher graduation rates? How do we ensure that our students are prepared for the real world by evaluating not only the response rates to job surveys, but also the knowledge rate that we have? How are they doing in terms of moving on to the best graduate and professional schools? And are they becoming leaders in their profession? So there's, those are some of the subtopics. When it comes to research, we're the only public research university. And we have to value research not only for the journal articles that result or the citations or the faculty accolades, but also more deeply into understanding what are the impacts of that research. Does research in the humanities lead to the training of individuals who have a deeper understanding of society so that we can better understand how to move forward in this time of very uh, divisive politics, for example? Or do we have faculty members who are going to be inventing the next great genetic uh, makeup of, of soybeans? And how do we make that impact more clearly, clearly articulate that to the community? The other compacts include effective engagement, as well as operational excellence, because we know we have to re-envision the university system. It can't be a confederacy of different organization that comes in together as a loose confederation. But at the same time, we don't want to stifle the innovation. We don't want to stifle the innovation and the unique attributes that we have at a public urban research university as opposed to a more rural science university. And the last thing is inclusive excellence. We have to have a university where every member of our community and the citizens of Missouri feel valued. We want to hear their input and we want to share how we're contributing to their success. And so those are the five Missouri compacts. We're very excited about them. In terms of strategies to get there, that is where we're going to, that is where we're going to be developing. And we're going to have to have different strategies in different universities based on the resources that they have, based on the constituents that they serve. But we're going to be evaluating that and giving feedback to the campuses. Any questions, you've heard, I'm sure you've heard this outline before, any questions to the president or any comments on how you translate that into, okay, what does the board do? Julia, do you wanna, something that, what, is, what difference, or do you sit and listen to it and say, yeah, boss, or is it a more active role? I think it has to be a more active role. I think that the state expects us to be a little bit more active. Um, that doesn't mean that we need to be making managerial decisions. And I can appreciate that difference having worked extensively with our board. Um, there's a lot of back and forth on that. And there's, you know, um, you don't bring it to the board a week, two weeks before you're asking them to approve it. Um, and so I think there's um, some additional um, effort that that we need to engage in together to understand what that, that right balance is. Um, because I think to discharge your fiduciary duty, um, you have to understand what's going on. And I have done a little bit of legwork in talking to some other universities uh, where <clears throat> they're not create, the board members aren't creating the work product, for God's sake, but uh, they, they've been consulted early and often. By the time the meeting comes around, it's old information to them. It's not tightly guarded until the last minute, and then, hey, here's what we want to do, okay? Here's a slide presentation, approve it. That's, um, that, that, I think, is, is how you get into trouble, um, because if, if we're going to be a, a solid unit, then, then I think that doesn't mean that we're going to be making managerial decisions, and I think that there's some um, 
you know, there's there's some work to go just on, on us understanding what that is. But I think that, you know, respectfully, with the exception of Marcy and David, the rest of it is just, you know, you might hear something from someone. Um, but there's not a lot of great communication from my perspective at this point on what is going on with respect to, we, we had a lot of minutia, in my opinion. At board um, meetings? Uh, leading up to board meetings, okay. yeah. Okay, John? Well, I, I'd probably like to know from the other board members. Uh, Julie and I were late this year, August, okay. I think. And so we missed the retreat, but it was probably good. I got to read, and I'd like to probably know from that how, how that was received. Uh, the second part of what Julia is saying, and I think when we get reports or it's a week in advance, it could almost get to, it'd be nice to be able not, eat, not necessarily have to see it early, that'd be fine. But we could eliminate maybe stuff we don't have to talk about at a board meeting. I mean, there, there's a lot of reports we get. If I meet with Ryan last week on the financial stuff and it's all clear then, because there's some issues that probably we don't get to talk about in general as a group when we're together that doesn't have anything to do with okaying the whatever report. Uh, and it almost might, it, it could at times, you could take some of the stuff that's quarterly and go, okay, that part's okay, but we've got other issues to discuss that we really don't get to them. We might get to them on a Friday, but by Friday, someone's got to catch a plane and we're, does that make sense? Yeah, and I, I mean, I think that, um, that, that our role as fiduciaries is an important one to, to, to keep in mind because if you don't really understand what you're approving, then this is superfluous. Um, that doesn't mean that you need to agree with every single thing because that's management. You have to keep it in mind with what the overall strategy is. But when you get something a week before, and I think a lot of us have a pretty busy schedules, um, and you haven't really been involved in it leading up to that, we, we got to figure that out, you know, depending on, I don't, th I don't see the committees as really doing much work, um, which I think is, is uh, others do it differently. Um, so, you know, th that involvement, I think there needs to be the right balance struck um, because I don't think the board should micromanage. Um, but I can just tell you from my own experience that the amount of information um, and the amount of back and forth and considerations on strategic initiatives at Express Scripts, um, those are done in lockstep with the board and they're not done two weeks before the board meeting. Um, what I heard from you when I made the phone calls, not from everybody, but from some, and from my own experience uh, with other boards, the single biggest complaint is we don't talk enough at board meetings. We listen, we listen, we listen, we get the report. We're not asked to comment on what are the forks in the road here? What are the alternatives? What are the, con have we thought about the other stuff? Um, and that involves, we sort of snuck up on the second topic here. How do we work with the president and his staff so we don't do their jobs? but we can operate effectively. So, David. The two, I, I'm really struck by what John said, and I want to pick up on that, because I actually have two specifics, and I'd be interested in the board's view, and Terry, your view on this, and whether this is a board role. I, I tend to think it is. We have never had, since I've been on the board, a real discussion of the, the chart that you had up. Are we one university? Are we a confederation? Are we a political alliance? To me, it is very hard to have the vision statement Jamie's talking about, which I think is critical, until we have some sort of board with presidential understanding of how we are functioning. And, and, and for some reason, we have, in my mind, purposefully avoided that because maybe it's because there's going to be differences of opinion. Maybe it's because there are people who don't like what we have to say. But I don't know how we can go further without discussing that. One other example, and, and you can tell me whether that's part of it or not. I think, and I had an interesting conversation with, with, with uh, a member of the university who I uh, tremendously respect last night about selectivity. And, and, and you look at issues like how Arizona State, which I think is the most fascinating success story in public universities today, and how they have managed to have a core of excellence while educating their population. And shouldn't we be having a discussion on selectivity as a board. And so though I, that's, those are questions, but they seem to me 
that we should be having those discussions more and other minutia less. I, I would, can I add um, yeah, sure. a little bit to what Julia and David were both talking about, but I believe that every member on this board spends a tremendous amount of time on this stuff. But I also believe that a tremendous amount of that time is on minutia. And I personally would rather spend, because we all are willing to do it, I personally would rather, you know, allocate time to the to bigger decisions like David's mentioning, tougher decisions, whatever it may be, and that's just that's just something I think is is critical. Um, John, I agree with the last three comments, um, and as I look around, I think I may be the only curator who was on the board when the strategic plan was adopted about five years ago. Did you come on with me? No, you you okay. were. You know because we had some resignations of those people. And um, I've said this uh, uh, once before, but I think it's worth repeating that uh, it was like a couple of weeks in my first meeting, and it was presented. And in retrospect, I came to realize that, that it, was not, um, a, it was not a one university plan, that each campus had developed strategic plans. I'm not even sure they used the same consultant, but maybe they did. Mm. Uh, and it was brought together, presented to the board in a rather short time frame, and I don't think meaningful board input. I'm going to end up here with a question of the president, because um, uh, I think that it's slightly improved since 1964 when I started at MU. And at that point, they were different campuses. I mean, the, the governance, that we didn't even have the efficiencies that come with the system. So we slightly improved five years ago. Um, but we've not confronted the issues that, that David has just nailed, selectivity versus accessibility, or can you, can you have both? Um, and uh, how are we going to operate? Is, it, is there going to be much more collaboration uh, between the campuses, and so my question of Moon is, um, are we tweaking the strategic plan that we supposedly have in place and that huge diagram, which is meaningless and can't be interpreted by anybody, or are we now in the process, because I know you've sent a directive out to the campuses for them to be working, um, but uh, are we in the process of, uh, of refreshing, or are we in the process of looking at some of the deeper issues? Um, and, and I think David has, has identified two of them, which I think you have to decide that before you can go to actually, before you can even get to mission, and the missions may be somewhat different for each campus, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, uh, how, how we're going to operate. Uh, and, and so we've got some profound questions that, as, no, as far as I know, would be the first time that the board would be confronting those in an open dialogue. So, John, uh, let me um, tackle the two-part question. One is, what do we as a board, as a university system, view the system role versus the campus role? And that's something that I am still struggling with uh, because I don't think it's been clearly, clearly defined what our role is. On uh, some cases, we may hear that campuses are given directives that need to follow. In some cases, and this is based on what I've been hearing from past practices. In some cases, they may get instructions that they may, campuses may or may wish, may not want to follow, and it's at their discretion. We can't operate an effective system that way. It has to have a very cohesive way for all of the campuses to understand what our goals are as a university and how to reach those goals. For example, if we are to say that we are now going to have a single platform where all online courses that are offered at all four campuses are going to be made available to all of the students, we can't have a campus that says, I don't want to participate in that. It's not a choice. We're going to participate. So I'm going through with my general officers and the chancellors to identify where we must collaborate. And because we haven't collaborated as a system, we are now paying for 
lack of efficiencies when it comes to student information system has hurt us tremendously. Lack of coordination and some other, other activities like human resources and finance has hurt us. Imagine all of the funds that could have been recouped for that investment. So that is a discussion that we need to continue to have as a board and to frame what we want to be, whether we want to be core management or strategic management. And we're going to discuss that tomorrow as part of the administrative study. I believe that it's going to be a model between the two, depending on the level, depending on the function. And we could talk more about that tomorrow. Second part of the question, yes? No, no. Second part of the question is, are we tweaking the strategic plan from five years ago? No, we're not. The reason we're not is, well, you don't have that to give doesn't reason, serve our purpose. Right. We have to focus on what is important for the university. And when the board mentioned that they would like to understand what the vision is for university so that we know what we're striving for, we've been having this exercise throughout the system with the campuses to say, if we're going to make an investment, is it going to support any one of those five Missouri compacts? If not, we're not going to make that investment, whether it's investment in time or uh, resources. And so with, this is a new day because we have to have a university strategic plan that takes elements of the strengths of each, each of the campuses to become the premier land-grant university. And we're not there. Our research has to improve dramatically. Our student success when it comes to graduation rate and affordability has to improve. And so this is going to be a brand new. We did not say to the individuals, take what you have five years ago and then let's improve it. We started from, from scratch to say, here are the five Missouri compacts that we're going to be going after. And here are the specific items, sub-items, that we need to pursue. So I, I would like to say that uh, you answered it the way I hoped you would. Um, and that uh, 50 years ago is a totally different time. I would submit that technology has changed mm. the way that students learn and the way that we can, if we adapt, teach. Um, and that's going to be the biggest change for this university mm -hmm. and a hard one, particularly for faculty who, who may end up uh, having to change the way in which they perform their tasks. So it's a monumental task and I'm glad that you're going to involve the board as we go along that path. I, I really love your answers. Actively. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. I'd just like to add one footnote. <clears throat> David made the statement a little earlier before four or five other people talked, but I wanted to come back to it. You said we haven't talked about one university. And I, I guess I, I, I must have missed the fact that we discussed that extensively at, the, uh, at our retreat in July, did we not? Isn't that where you got the, the uh, handle uh, one ship Steelman? <laughs> As I recall, we had quite a discussion on that. I, yeah, and let me rephrase. I, I, if I said talk about it, I, I, what I meant was have a board discussion where we actually try to reach a board decision on it. In other words, that wasn't a discussion we had where the board made any decision or agreed with you no, on I, that? No, I, I actually thought we talked around the issue. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and in fact did not get to the fact that I don't think we can get to a vision. We did not get where I think Dr. Choi just talked about, which I think is going to be part of the uh, PWC administrative review. Yeah, I think we, my impression was we just talked about it. And, and then we talk about it and then it seems like I'm not sure if we're moving in that direction, though. You know, simple things like, um, I guess we were talking about them the other day, being able to transfer credits from university to university. That doesn't seem, I'm not an expert with the universities, but that doesn't seem very complicated. And it seems like small steps even haven't been taken in that six months to make that happen. So 
that's where we, you know, when we start talking about that, you know, we would like to see a little more action and movement. But I think, I'm not sure where the, where the holdup is, you know, and I think we'd like to, you know, maybe have a discussion on that. Maybe that's for another day, but yeah, go ahead. So that step is more complicated than even I expected. And the reason that it has become complicated is when the university selected PeopleSoft way back when, instead of ensuring that each campus follow the same protocol and data definition, they were allowed to define their own data definition and to have staff members associated to support the individual campus data system. And now we have such a customized system, they don't talk to each other. And so we are now going back to having to fix that problem um, very proactively. But we want to get to a place where it's easier for students to transfer their credits from Columbia College to UMSO than it is between UMSO and SNT. And that's something that, those are just some of the examples of things that we just need to fix. Yeah. And we have, Jeff? I believe we have four customized PeopleSoft, four different ones, right? That's right. That's right. Not uncommon. Not uncommon at all, but not acceptable. That's right. And again, let me just follow up because when I got on the board, and it takes a while to realize it, uh, university uh, administration is very good at saying we want you to ask the tough questions. And then all of a sudden, you know, two or three years in, you say, you know, they're not asking for any answers or decisions. They just want us to ask the tough questions. Mm -hmm. Going to what Daryl just said, and, and I'm not sure where we do the answers and where we don't. I believe very, very strongly that a board has decisions it has to make, that it has to do more than ask questions, and that a, a board has answers that it has to give, and where I don't am not so clear is where those are. I just know on something like transferability, obviously it's difficult, obviously it has to be implemented, but I don't know why we as a board have not made a statement that we will do that and we will get there. It seems to me that is a board decision we should make, but you tell me whether I'm right or wrong. So we are already moving in that direction, but in order for us to come have a unified system, we'll probably require about $80 million of investment. And we, we had Gary Allen look into that. Now, that may be an investment that we say we have to just make because we have to be more collaborative. But given the state of finances now, where do we put our, do we hobble together with the system that we have or to get a new system implemented so that we can collaborate with each other? So the trade-off is then we'll have less funds available for need-based scholarships. And those are things that we're gonna be going through. And the way that we wanna do that is present the options that we're being presented with and discuss it at the board because that's a major decision, right? But we don't want you to be unaware of these types of problems. And this is where some major decisions by the board will be very helpful, very helpful. But we have to bring those problems to your attention too. Do you, I don't know, to that point, does it make sense again to decide who we are and what we want to be and communicate that, that we're the University of Missouri system with four great campuses underneath of it, and each one bleeds black, gold, purple, red, and green, but together we bleed Missouri, and at least start communicating to the public who we are and where we're going, and hopefully that draws more attention, more recruiting, and then we're able to make these investments that further support our vision and initiatives. I, I, I don't know if that and I, does. I'm, I'm a big fan of, of all four campuses, but of course I'm an MU graduate, so when I saw the 160 over 90 presentation, you know, I think, I'm, I'm not sure if some of the other campuses walked away saying, hey, what about us? Because we're, we're talking about Mizzou here. Why aren't we, um, you know, bragging on the whole system? And it doesn't seem that complicated, you know, as if we're going to be system first or system focused, you know, then I think we've got to um, do that with some of our big initiatives. The 160 over 90, how hard would it be to just include, you know, all, all the campuses in that um, and, and not create a rift? Because I think that's what it did was maybe created a rift on some of the campuses, like we're going to invest all this money in MU, but not, the, not all the rest of the campuses. So 
maybe you could speak to that. But I, but I would like, you know, as we move forward to just, you know, keep that system <coughs> focus in mind and bringing everyone together and, and not, you know, seems like sometimes we're divisive on it. We're, mm. we're talking out of both sides of our mouth sometimes. So, yeah, yeah. Uh, talking about 160 over 90, uh, I think all four campuses realize that what happened to Mizzou in 2015 affected all of them. In fact, uh, when, it came, when it comes to state support, we're treated as one system. And so when Mizzou was punished with uh, reductions in state support, that affected all four campuses. And the reason that we decided to focus on Mizzou with the marketing campaign is because we knew that that was the business at hand. The other campuses did not see the type of reductions in enrollment that Mizzou has had. They were pretty stable. And this was primarily a sentiment as well as enrollment campaign to focus on Mizzou. And based on that campaign, we're already seeing some very positive moves in terms of application increases, which has been very helpful. And once Mizzou becomes stronger, that helps the other universities. And when UMKC becomes even stronger with investments that are needed in, in some of the key priorities, that'll also make the university system stronger. So we had, a, we had a decision to make in terms of what was the most critical issue that we had to address with our marketing campaign, and that's the reason. But in general, we want to look at ways that we can elevate all four campuses. There's no question about that. We can't have a weak link in our, in our four campus system because that takes away from the value of the University of Missouri. I was just going to add to that, you know, because we sensed the tension among the campuses when there was so much marketing efforts being put into just the Columbia campus. Is there a way within the 160 over 90 budget to maybe carve out a sliver that is a University of Missouri system kind of promo? I think one of their strong suits was their videography, and everyone got really pumped up to see A&M in Wisconsin. If there could just be a, another piece, and this is just an idea, you know, that focuses on, hey, we're a system, and we've got Mizzou and we've got S and T and we got UMSL and so there is a, a shared love uh, across this whole state and not just a, um, just a total Mizzou focus. Uh, that's 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 a great that's a great idea. Um, we didn't do that because of the focus on Mizzou and also just a, a clarification. I think uh, there's some misconception from the campuses that think that we use system funds. This the funds for 160 over 90 are co is coming only from Mizzou. And this was their marketing campaign. And the other campuses also have their own marketing campaigns too. But if there's a way that we can help coordinate, I think that would be wonderful. But you know, in a, in a location like St. Louis, if we had <coughs> recruitment campaigns for the University of Missouri system, I think there may, it may create some confusion uh, just because are we trying to promote UMSO or Columbia or UMKC? But that's something to think through as well. If we, and, and Moon, can I comment on that? Because excuse, if, excuse me, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Yep. It's a little unrelated, but going back to Jamie's first point, as far as having that first step forward is defining the mission and what we are as a board to achieve. I think there are some unintended consequences or perhaps maybe um, intended consequences that results from that, which would be helpful with different groups, such as students, for example. When I meet with student groups and I talk about the curators, what the board does, I find an overwhelming amount of students do not know what the board of curators do, what the mission is, and what their role is in the university. Um, a short example of that is when I speak to students, I kind of do like a pop quiz type of scenario where I ask the students, raise your hand if you think the board of curators make anywhere between zero and $50,000, 50 to 100. And the majority of students think that curators, yes, think that your all's positions pay you over a hundred grand. <laughs> I'll <laughs> make that motion. No. <laughs> <laughs> I'll and, it. <laughs> and so I really think it's important to define that mission because it's going to have those consequences that stem from it of really getting that buy-in from students to help. Um, really promote the mission of what this board's moving forward so that we can move forward collectively and not with attention. Can I come after Daryl? Sure. sure. Can I come after Daryl? Sure. This is, this may be a rhetorical question, but 
how can we have confusion amongst campuses if we're one university? You know, it, and, I, and I kind of pre I said that, um, I think, at UMSL, some of the UMSL folks, um, we had a great presentation yesterday. But, you know, we talk about confusion amongst campuses, but if we're the University of Missouri, there is no confusion. So when we go to market ourselves and we say, yeah, you're interested in Mizzou, well, great, you can be right here, take some online courses. We can connect you to all those universities right here, you know, through whatever technology we may have. And so we've got to, I think we've got to move away from competition to we're all one university in Missouri. Daryl, I, I agree with you that uh, when it comes to marketing the overall university, to say you're, we're a University of Missouri system, that's very effective in terms of going to the legislature to talk about our research, the student success and the value that we create. But the universe, people don't apply to the University of Missouri system. They apply to the campuses because of the programs that they offer. And what, I was just speaking specifically specifically about the recruitment of students. And with recruitment of students, it's really more important to talk about the programs of excellence that's available. But if we had an advertisement that says, apply to the University of Missouri system in St. Louis, I think the students may not know, well, what does that mean? Where do I go? Do I want to go to UMSO, but are you not telling me that as, a, as an advertisement that you should consider UMKC? It's, it's, I want to be able to give the campuses the uh, flexibility to do the marketing when it comes to the enrollment because markets are different. For example, St. Louis has what's called the metro rate that they offer to the state of Illinois to attract more students. They're more likely to come here from Edwardsville as opposed to going to Columbia. And so I just want to be mindful of some differences in the campuses when it comes to marketing. That's all. So I share Daryl's sensitivity about how that marketing uh, was presented, and I, I think I shared it at the time. Uh, the answer that I thought I heard, and I want to make sure that it is the answer, is that uh, the Mizzou campus, or the MU campus, if we want to use that, uh, had suffered um, a severe image problem, in part be because of things that occurred on campus, but also the unusual way that the leadership changed two at a time, and that uh, we can't have another year of bad enrollment there without it perpetuating. And I thought what I heard was that, yes, this was going to be aimed at that campus because you do recruit to campuses. Uh, maybe someday we'll be recruiting to the one university, but that may be three or five years away because that may be, if we agree upon it, a goal um, but that that same marketing firm, or however you want to describe it, uh, may be made available either for a, a university campaign or uh, to a lesser extent uh, because of the size uh, to the other campuses. But we were doing it special for that one year, and I think it I think it's in the process and working, um, and we're in, it's being done out of the Mizzou budget. But it, I was sensitive just as you were. And, and am I right that, uh, that there will be other, uh, uh, let's say, ways of getting the message out for the excellence of the other campuses as time goes on? Especially as we talk about the value of research universities and what we bring to the citizens of Missouri, I think that's a good opportunity. And John, you are right. The reason that I decided to put that on there was many of the curators were asking me at the same time, what are we gonna do with enrollment at Mizzou? And we had to take action uh, and, and find a chancellor who was willing to lay out the resources for this very important initiative, but really focus at least primarily in the beginning on Mizzou because that's where the significant problems existed. So you're right. I, I think that Everyone agreed that we needed the marketing for Mizzou. And I think some of this discussion may be more forward looking, to be fair, um, just based upon the conversations that I've had with, with all of you. Um, in terms of the, you know, the $80 million that it may take to beef up the IT infrastructure, that to me seems like something that should go on a capital planning 
um, budget and, and be discussed. And we have to obviously make decisions on what we're going to prioritize, and I'm sure that's coming. Um, this isn't intended to, uh, to be critical in any way. I think we're making some significant strides, which are terrific. But to me, making that decision of whether or not we are going to be, whether you call it one university, and I don't mean that in the, in the sense that um, you get your degree from, where I mean, it's obviously going to be campus specific, but to the extent that, you know, with respect to undergraduate programs, probably at OMSL and UMKC at least, you're serving the, the, the greater metropolitan areas by and large. Um, in order for that to grow, um, I do think that focusing on what we're good at at each campus and offering folks that system opportunity that you're not confined because you can't pick up and move to a different location. You're not confined if you're at one or any of these universities um, to the programs offered at that university. Many years away, there may be people taking courses at home and you may not be confined to the four campuses. But in terms of that decision, I think, of whether we're going to be one university or four campuses that do their own thing, to me, I think that we have to answer that even if we don't have all the answers today on what that's going to look like, because otherwise there's, I think, uh, I think it's difficult to make priority decisions based on defined variables for what we're going to invest resources into, um, because every campus can't be everything. Mm -hmm. um, and so that doesn't mean that there's no duplicity either. But defining what that means and, and what each one's going to focus on, I hope, is something that we're going to um, actually make a decision and come out on um, through all the right channels, through shared governance and, and all the right ways. But I do think that that's a question that needs to be answered because I don't, I, I agree with your compacts and I think that those are the right noble endeavors. But there's an overarching how um, in terms of the organization's management and operations, I think that a lot of us are, you know, questioning um, what that is. Um, <clears throat> no, no. Good point. I'm going to suggest that we focus on something, in a sense, more immediate and concrete, and that is the board meetings, communications at them, communications before, communications afterwards. <laughs> Um, it's under the heading of how do you work with the, the president. Um, let me just add one qualification. There's a kind of an academic distinction, but an important one between the president, who's sitting right there, and the presidency, which is the president, in this case his team, uh, his senior staff. You know, you can kind of have that ripple out uh, in, in the pond. So. In this conversation, don't, don't, I'm, uh, don't speak, just, speak just about Dr. Choi, but the whole team and how the what most productive, least frustrating way for board meetings to take place. Topics might be, do we get the information early enough? Do we get too much of it? You know, there used to be an old, um, <laughs> old rule here, give them a wheelbarrow full of stuff and you know, they'll, they'll just kind of be lost and we can go do what we want. Um, is it too little? Uh, is it too late? Uh, are the pre most staff, and I've been one of them, uh, want to frankly uh, please you by having considered all the options, as opposed to saying, here are three areas where we really need the board's thought on before we. So, that kind of thing. What frustrates you in the meetings? What works, works well and you want to keep up? What, what, do you, what do you want the president and his team to consider going forward? John, can you step in? <laughs> I have a question. Yeah. You had 1015 written on your first sheet. What did that mean? Uh, that meant we had to end that conversation <laughs> at uh, 1015. No, we're, we're, yeah. just, we're just going to roll till 12. Then. No, we're going now. As, as a timing matter, we're going to go about another uh, uh, 17, 18 minutes, and then we're going to uh, go into executive session and continue. Uh, 
the, the board assessment, but it'll be an executive session. So we got about another 17 or 18 minutes. I just needed a break, and I didn't want to miss anything. Well, I can like wait 17. Let's, let's take a five-minute break. Okay. No, no. I, I, can, I can go another 17, 18 All right. Minutes. Okay. Yeah. Let's do that. We'll probably go about 15 minutes. So uh, maybe I'll, we'll keep it to 10 or 15. <laughs> uh, I'll make a comment. Oh, well, then we're going to go into uh, right. executive session. Then we could certainly take a break. Yeah. Do it. Terry, let me, let me make a, a, an observation just in yeah. a, in a, uh, in, this, this has been really good, but in reading some of the things that you've written, you talk about, uh, you talk about boards having to develop a new mindset. And you, use that, you use that term. Uh, and I think that that's kind of what we've said here, that boards in 2017 and 18 are different than boards a decade ago, maybe even five years ago. And uh, I think what you're hearing from us is that both individually and collectively, we as board members and as a board want to add value. And that's a term you've used. Uh, that's what we see as our role, and that's what we want to do. We want to add value. We just don't want to sit around and talk about things and hear reports, but actually be part of improving the system capture it better than I did, Mr. Chairman. It's about making a difference, as opposed to just presiding. That's, that if I had, yeah, that, that's right. And my sense is that's what everybody uh, that I talk to wants to do. They don't even think about do they want to do, just sit back and watch. No, that wasn't, that wasn't part of it. John? John and then oh, Daryl. Daryl Daryl's Let Daryl go over. Okay. okay, you asked about frustrating things. Yes. Um, <laughs> We're, That's a surefire yeah, starter, a, by the way, in case you a, get in this role. We have an oversight responsibility as a board. That's, I think that's part of our role. And so I, I really am sympathetic to some of the administrators we ask. You know, sometimes we have to have, ask them hard questions for information, whatever. And I think they're conflicted, to be honest. You know, why would you send something that may hurt you or your boss? You know, and it may be something completely, you know, that, that, that really doesn't have any implications, but I think... I think that it's tough to do that. We have full-time jobs, so for us to do research and dig deep and find out all kinds of information is just not possible. So that, that's one thing that's frustrating for us is I think we need, and, and then two, the system office is there where the officers are all with you know, some of the people that we're relying on to get information to do our oversight responsibilities. Like I said, there's just a natural conflict there. We, they don't, people don't see us every day, but they do see the president and his staff every day. It's not like we're, you know, but we're just trying to do our jobs. How do we get to the point where the board has dedicated people that can not necessarily um, feel that conflict or have a conflict, you know, when you're trying to, when they're trying to assist you to do your oversight responsibilities? That's one thing that I think is tough. We're fiduciaries, we have to do our job, and we need people committed to us. As an attorney, I can't represent both sides. That's, that's against, I, I get disbarred. But we've, we put people in positions that I think are very tough for them because they've got to help us do our job to oversee them and their bosses. That's, you know, that's something I, that I find very difficult. Um, editorializing real quick, as, an, as a, an appealing idea, it's a bad idea. Yeah. Because it automatically sets up, uh, I've never seen it work, sets up a conflict situation mm -hmm. um, where unless the, uh, the people working directly for you, kind of other than the auditor, for example, right, uh, report problems, they aren't doing their job. It should be the job of the senior staff to walk both sides of the street. Can they walk both sides of the street? I mean, I'm, I'm not sure. People that. have done it. A lot okay. of productive systems have done it. I'm sorry, Dale. Mm -hmm. I don't want to. I don't oh, want to no. close off the conversation. Yeah, that's that's a, just, know. just my perspective. And is it fair to them to ask them to walk both sides of the street? I guess is a good question. There shouldn't be two sides it. of the street in a way. It's one avenue that you're all on. But anyway, anyway, it's a good conversation to have. John, did you want to pick up? Well, I hate to say we get too much stuff because some like maybe to read it. Uh, I'm a fiduciary in my other world on every pension plan, but it is a lot of stuff. Uh, I wish we had a way, and I know staff wants, because they, they want us to get all that stuff. If there's a way, even when we had it and we evaluated it, I think there should be a way that we can eliminate some when we're going to meet. Like, like some stuff that we cover every quarter. I mean, I, again, you oversee it, you look at it, you go, okay, what are the, what are, 
if we're meeting at UMKC or Humsoil or Rolla, it doesn't matter what are specifically, besides the numbers and the stuff that we're supposed to oversee, what do we really want to get done? Because to me, the meetings have always been, it's kind of laid out, right? Here, here's Ryan, and then here comes Tom, and then here comes the medical people. I mean, I get it. But I'm already on the committee at the hospital. I kind of already understand all that. I would rather talk amongst the board members about the importance of whatever these two days were set for December. Uh, now, it could be something in one of the reports, right? It could be something that was sent out that, that we all say, hey, this is, we got to go through this one. And I don't know if there's a mechanism to do that. Do you use the consent agenda? We do. Extensively? Uh, that might help. It, I would say yes. I, I think I think our I'd be interested in other people's yeah. thoughts. I think we pretty effectively use the uh, consent agenda. Maybe not enough. Yeah, that's a kind of what might be. I I think we need a dashboard. I uh, mean, a two pager. Here you go, summing it up. You know, kind of a thing, and then you know, there's other detail. But I think I think a two pager. You know, with with enough information on it to, and then too, when we set, let's say Moon's got his list of objectives that he's that he provided us in, in July, and then he's revised. I would like to see our meeting structured around that. You said this is what, you know, um, respectfully, Moon, this is what you said you were gonna do, this is what the university is doing, we're gonna report on these topics. Maybe we took, pick the 10 most important from that. This is what we expect to hear about at the meetings, the price, the, the, the report we're gonna see this week. Hey, what are you doing at each meeting? At each meeting, we need a report on that. So targeted, targeted things that we talk about, not being just told what folks want to tell us, you know, at the meetings. It's a thought. I, I think that's one thing we've talked a lot about, and it's difficult to do, but to have that metric dashboard. Mm -hmm. I mean, in my my business, I get a every month. If it's not to me by the fifteenth of the month, everyone freaks out. It's a financial ratios. That's how are you doing now? What did it look like last quarter? What did it look like year to date? end of last year and we all look at the same thing every single meeting and you can trend and track changes so I don't know what those key performance metrics are at a whole system and then campus by campus but I, it would be really great if we could have a one-page cover sheet that gave us a real quick glance where, where are we trending and where do we need to actually spend some more time for deeper conversations not uncommon in this business either Jamie yep. yeah along those lines actually Jamie um, stole the, the words right out of my mouth um, I don't, I'm, I'm less focused on the length of the document initially, but we've been talking about a metrics-based approach um, for a while, and I know there's a lot that goes into that, um, but, you know, Jamie had shown me the University of Texas system, and, you know, the, there, there's just, there's a lot already worked out there that I think, um, you know, Texas is a well-funded state. <laughs> um, to me, I, I'm not interested in um, necessarily philosophizing um, a new way to do everything, why don't we steal from the best and make up the rest? I mean, because those metrics are, they have dashboards and they have, you know, full accountability reports and they have, like, what, 20 campuses? I, I don't know. 14. That 14. It, to me, um, th this has already been done in a lot of different places and, you know, we could burn a lot more time coming up with our own, um, but I think we could borrow from what others have done and spent a lot of time and, and money doing and then tweak it. And so to me, I'd like to, to this point, you know, I feel like to some extent, um, everyone pr probably prepares extensively for these meetings and comes in and knows their stuff and everybody does a great job presenting and we really value everyone's input. But we don't know what we're supposed to be. It, it's, it's so much, it's, it's a lot of information. It's kind of a, here's what we've been up to. Well, how are we supposed to measure that, right? You know, I, some stuff you may not need to cover because uh, you're already hitting it, but on the, on the key critical issues, the number of um, enrollees, the per percent of graduation rate, um, I understand those are metrics that will not be reported at every board meeting because you're not gonna have graduations at every board meeting, but how do we get to, you know, accreditation, um, you know, the standards that we need to meet and then what we need to meet to be in the AAU or to be in our two facility, what are our overarching goals within each of those facilities to grow and how are we trending on that? Um, there's also a lot of, you know, key strategic initiatives that we talked about at the finance um, committee meeting that you're not necessarily going to talk about every time, but 
what is it that we, sh we should be measuring to determine whether or not we are successful? Because otherwise, I think everyone's going to position as it's a highly, <laughs> higher education is infamously political. And all we're going to get is all the good news. <laughs> you know, so I mean, I'm looking at um, how can we help, not penalize. And I I'd like to know how we're trending on, on very specific metrics so that we can know whether we're making any difference, figure out where we need resources. You know, I think that there's a lot of opportunity for collaboration there because you have somebody here from each of the parts of the states and there's a lot of people that want to see this, this school succeed. The schools in all four campuses, right? And I think there's a tremendous amount of community support out there, um, but we, we need to measure these things accurately to be able to focus on where we need to um, where management needs to focus, right? How do we know if management's doing a good job if we don't know what we're supposed to be measuring management on? Let me turn to John, but then me, let me ask the president after John speaks, what is a practical, efficient way to get this done using your senior staff so that board members don't have to run off and try to do it, et cetera? But John had his hand up. I, I, I agree with almost everything Julia has said, except uh, I, I take issue with you know, referring to the University of Texas is the best because we're going to be playing them in football. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and not, not that tech, let me be clear, I was not suggesting the University of Texas was the best. I just want to steal who, from whoever the best is. Uh, but seriously, uh, we, we had the best meeting ever of the Health Affairs Committee recently, and they presented us for the first time with a dashboard. It was a little too busy to get into because we only have 10 minutes allotted uh, today. Um, uh, but they also had a financial, uh, a, a good sheet that's one page. And I, I've asked Jonathan if he will present that. And I, I do think that dashboards uh, and maybe by system, but a simplified dashboard so that we can m measure how we're doing. I'm used to that on other boards as well. And I think it's a great idea. Um, so if I can, just one quick sure, little note. Sure. You know, Daryl suggested, if I heard him right, that the board had its own staff to do this kind of sleuthing, and I, I demurred that, that that was a bad structure. So if you could address that as well. So I do believe that the board meetings will be more productive if we have discussions like this. And I think um, we have to really go back and think about why is our board meeting structured the way it is, right? There may be a CRR that dictates how it's structured, but we have to go back and really identify those reports that have to be made, those reports that could be sent ahead of time, and it could be approvals can be in the consent agenda. This has been productive, very productive. And I'm glad that Tom George is here. I wish that the other chancellors were here to listen to this because this has been a very productive discussion. <laughs> Tell you what, let's, uh, let's go ahead and take, uh, any more questions before we go into executive session? I just wanted to give Jamie credit for that dashboard idea. I, I, I mentioned it, she had been saying it a long well. time. Oh, yeah. yeah. She's been talking about it for eight months. Yeah. <laughs> this is a university. It, it, it takes a while. <laughs> let's, uh, let's go ahead and take about a uh, five, six, seven minute break. And at, uh, at the end of that break, we will go into executive session. The Board of Curators is going to stay in here with uh, Terry. So, what's it? Uh, Move to go into executive session. Do we have a second? I will promise you. Second. All in favor say aye. No, no, no. We have, we have to have, I'm sorry, we have to have a vote on that. Cindy, can you uh, call a roll call vote on the uh, executive session? Curator Burnsick? Yes. Curator Chapman? Yes. Curator Farmer? Yes. Curator Graham? Yes. Curator Lehman? Yes. Curator Phillips? Yes. Curator Snowden? Yes. Curator Steelman? Yes. Curator Sunville? Yes. All votes in favor. Motion carried. We're in executive session after the break.